You think uh, polo players need legs? Yeah. Why? Why they? Why they need legs, man? Cause I don't know, man. You never skip leg day, man. You never skip leg day, yeah, man. Is that how it's gonna be? It's them fundamentals, man. Yeah, the fundamentals, yeah, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> watched it's a sport called canoe polo or kayak polo in some countries now it's a very very fascinating sport with so much action it's dynamic it's explosive it's very very exciting it is a sport with a growing popularity now more and more players are playing every year especially in Europe you guys are doing such an amazing job developing the sport we really are trying hard to develop the sport looking at maybe going into the Olympics in the next decade and um, there are semi-professional and professional leagues happening right now so definitely something worth watching and pay attention to if you don't know what the sport is now if you're a polo player I'm pretty sure you've encountered this kind of conversation where people start asking you oh you must be you must be really strong with your upper body you don't really need your legs do you now that's not entirely true People just seem to forget that the importance of the lower half of our body, which plays a very, very important role in this sport. So if you're a canoe polo player and you don't train your legs, you might want to keep watching this video. Now, I want to talk about this, the use of lower half of our body in this sport with three aspects. Okay, the first is human anatomy. The second is the seating position. The third is the most difficult part to understand, which is the biomechanics, human anatomy, knowing how our hips are situated and what muscles are attached to the hip and the legs. It's essential to understand which part of the body you should be training when it comes to playing the sport. The most important motion that I'm going to talk about today is the anterior tilting and the posterior tilting of the hip. Now, you might be thinking, why am I talking about the hips when the topic is on the legs? The fact is that actually a lot of the leg muscles have attachments on the hip. When the muscles are originated and attached onto a different part of the body, it obviously causes motion onto these parts of the body. So using this 3D program, I'm going to show you how illustration program developed by 3d for medical it's extremely functional and today we are going to use this to talk about the muscles that we are interested in okay, the first one is this the gluteus max turning on the motion you can see one of the most important function of glute max is extending the hips okay now the next group of muscles that we are going to talk about are the hamstring muscles there is a few of them actually, semi-membranosus, semi-tendinosus, and then we have got the biceps femoris, which is divided into two parts. We've got a long head and we've got the short head functions. But what people don't so often talk about is their ability to extend the hips, okay? So this group of muscle are actually very, very important when it comes to hip extension. When it comes to the anterior and the posterior tilts that I spoke about earlier, there are a lot of muscles that are contributing to that type of motion. So bring the muscles up, erector spinae muscles now. Now they're called that, as you can probably imagine, their major function is to extend your trunk. Looking at the attachments of the muscles, it kind of gives a pretty good understanding of how our muscles affect the way that pelvis moves. In the front here, imagine we've got our abdominal muscle pulling it up. So when you contract your abdominal muscle, very naturally you'll see your pelvis rotating 
backwards or tilting posteriorly. Now another two muscles on the back side that's also really important to look at are the erector spinae that when it's contracting you can imagine that the pelvis is going to have an anterior tilt. And finally this muscle attaching from the lower half are hamstrings. Now when hamstrings contract it pulls the lower side of the pelvis down and causes posterior tilt. What does all that matter when it comes to canon polo? If you think about the way that we're seated inside the boat, it's that our seats are supposed to fit the width of our hips and then our knees are firmly pushed open against the side of the boat and with our feet pushing against the foot pads firmly. Now, with these three major contact points inside the boat locked in, we are essentially a very firm unit with the boat itself. Now, this is really important for you to do all the nose dipping motion and then the lifting nose or all these other type of boat movements. And now it's time to talk about biomechanics. This is where it gets a little bit tricky, but it's really, really interesting. So one of the most important movements that polo players do is the nose dip. The front of the boat, we often try to go underneath someone and try to wreck them up for whatever reason it is during the game. Now, there's a few phases in this motion. Firstly, we got this wind up phase where you extend your back a little bit and then you start driving forward to create that forward dipping momentum of your entire body. And we start dipping forward. Our lower back at this moment will start pulling on the pelvis, meaning that it's trying to anteriorly rotate the pelvis. Now, when that is happening at the same time, our heels are pushing against the bottom of the boat. Remember that I said the lower half is really firmly fixed. Now we know that the hamstrings and gluteal muscles are actually really important drivers for hip extension so that they are actually working quite hard while you're doing that dipping motion. A really similar concept applies when it comes to doing the stern turn, whether it's trying to make a quick turn or you're just trying to do a crossover. It is a really, really important movement in polo games. So our abs are pulling quite hard to posteriorly rotate the pelvis. At the same time, rectus femoris, along with two other major muscles called the iliacus and the psoas muscle are all hip flexors, okay? Now these muscles are working really hard to try to keep that posterior rotation and then the hip flexion happening at the same time. They are working really, really hard so that you can lift your nose properly and then do the crossover that you wanted. Now we understood how the anatomy, the seating position and the biomechanics of our body and the boat works together. It is time to start training your legs. Realistically though, because we are not professional athletes and it's not a professional sport, hopefully one day you'll be, but there's only this much time we can build our life around training. So prioritizing the major muscle groups so the polo game, the shoulders, the back, the arm muscles, definitely agree to that. But do not forget about the lower limbs. The, a good way to do training on it is that come up with a few exercises that you can do at home be with some dumbbells to make it simple and quick that you can do early in the morning before you go out to work outside of the session hours. And also something really important is that the neuromuscular control of these muscles, meaning how well your brain controls the muscles, the better they get, the more you will feel that you got more control of your boat. So start training your legs and you will see the difference very, very soon. Happy birthday, Daniel. Thank you. Come on, Daniel. <laughs> Thank you. How old today? 20. 20? Yeah. Right what? old age yeah, of 20. Just, eight days, eight I just days. got off my teens. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I'm, a, I'm a big boy now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just going down.